The theme of tonight's program is privacy in the digital age. Uh, largely through the revelations of Edward Snowden, we've learned just how far the technology has gone and how far the will of the government has gone to intrude into our daily lives. NACDL has positioned itself in the forefront of advocacy on these issues. This is an issue, these are issues that I've been particularly involved in on behalf of NACDL in the last few years. Uh, Jerry Goldstein and I have been co-chair of the Fourth Amendment and Privacy uh, Committee of, the, of NACDL. Some of the activities, some of the things that we've done uh, to further the advocacy in this area uh, have been reports issued by our committee on such things as drone, drone surveillance. Uh, we have a web page on our website. We call it the drone page where you can go and get information about the latest developments and litigation that's involved with drone surveillance. We've issued reports on digital searches. Uh, what sort of search warrant, what sort of limitations should be, should be in a search warrant that limits the government's ability to search through all of your material, materials on your digital hard drive or in your cell phone when they only have probable cause for one particular issue. Our advocacy in Congress in this area has been impactful. Most recently, we were involved in the reauthorization of the Chapter 215 of the Patriot Act. It was limited somewhat. As you know, uh, in six months or so, it's going to be severely cut back. We didn't get everything we wanted, but it certainly was a good step forward. Probably the most interesting thing we've done, the most impactful thing we've done this year is back in uh, late April, NACDL sponsored a symposium that was held at uh, American University Law School where we brought together industry leaders in, high, in the high-tech fields, scholars who write and teach uh, in the area of digital privacy, practitioners who told us how to approach uh, motion practice in cases where this sort of technology is used and maybe more importantly how to discover if it is being used. Uh, that symposium was a big success. The, the conversation uh, from that symposium started other conversations and uh, raised the awareness, we think, of certainly the practitioners that, that tuned in and also uh, some of the news media that tuned in about how pervasive the problem is. There is the, the title of the keynote tonight is Surveillance Snowden and us, making the Fourth Amendment live. And there is no better person that I can think of to deliver that message than Michael Tiger. I have the distinct honor of introducing Michael, but also the challenge. Uh, the challenge is there are so many things that I could say about Michael, so many things that I could tell you about what he's done in his career that he wouldn't have any time left to talk if I included them all. So. Here's, here's just a sampling. And a lot of this came from information that Michael sent me and things Michael said about himself, so I'm confident it's mostly true. <laughs> After completing his undergraduate degree at University of California, Berkeley, he graduated from Berkeley Law School in 1966, where he was Order of the Cloth and Editor-in-Chief of the California Law Review. He was hired by Justice William Brennan and drove across the country with his family. According to one thing I read, he had $10 in his pocket. Got to Washington, ready to take his job as Justice Brennan's clerk and found out that Justice Brennan had changed his mind. Justice Brennan had been pressured, in his own words, greatly pressured by conservative columnists and none other than J. Edgar Hoover because they were concerned about Michael's subversive activities, his leftist activities while he was at Berkeley. He had had the audacity to openly oppose the House Un-American Activities Committee, attended a leftist youth conference in Helsinki, articulated support for the Cuban Revolution, and perhaps most damning, he had demonstrated against segregation. Justice Brennan, asked for Michael's permission to release a list of his political activities, and Michael refused. 
So when did the shortest clerkship ever on the Supreme Court? And thus started one of the most celebrated legal careers in our time. Over the span of a career that included practicing for a time with Edward Bennett Williams, Williams and Con Connolly, where he was a partner for a time, uh, with his own firm, with his partner Sam Buffone, and just simply, when I met him, as a Tiger law firm. Uh, his clients and the issues involved in their cases represent some of the most important litigation in the last almost 50 years. His clients have included Isabel Letier, the family of Roddy Moffitt, many victims of the Pinochet repression, Angela Davis, H. Rapp Brown, John Conley, K. Bailey Hutchinson, The Washington Post, Fantasy Films, Terry Nichols, Allen Ginsberg, Leonard Peltier, The Charleston Five, Service Employees International Union, Fernando Chavez, Carl Deesh Wolf, and Lynn Stewart. He's been, yes. Uh, He's been chair of the uh, 60,000 member section of litigation of the American Bar Association and chair of the board of directors of the Texas Resource Center for Capital Litigation. Apparently, there wasn't enough injustice in the United States to keep him busy, so he made several trips to South Africa, working with organizations of African lawyers engaged in the struggle to end apartheid. After the release of Nelson Mandela from prison, he went on to lecture on human rights issues and advise and to advise the African National Congress on issues in drafting a new constitution. He's been actively involved in efforts to bring justice to justice members of the Chilean junta, including former President Pinochet. He's been on the faculty, been tenured professor at, at uh, American University, acting professor at law at UCLA, at UCLA uh, just Jamal Chair at the, in law at the University of Texas, where, where we met, and lectured in dozens of law schools. He's co-authored 13 books, three plays, and scores of articles and essays. Justice Brennan, perhaps with a tinge of conscience over dismissing Michael so quickly, remarked in 1999 that Michael Tiger is, is one of tire, of tire, his career is one of tireless striving for justice that stretches his arms towards perfection. And this is the coolest part of the introduction. I, I love this. This, I'm gonna, we, we talked about some victories that Michael had. I'm gonna talk about a third place finish uh, that perhaps he, might be pretty proud of. In 1999, the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice held a ballot for Lawyer of the Century. Tiger was third in the balloting behind Clarence Darrow and Thurgood Marshall. And I don't know for sure, but I suspect it was a close vote. Michael? Well, thank you. It, um, I appreciate the introduction. And, you know, we, we as lawyers, I know I am, as a, we're just massive blobs of ego suspended over a chasm of insecurity. <laughs> and it's always good to hear that sort of thing. Um, and I'm honored to be here tonight where Peter Goldberger, my friend, is going to be uh, to get the award, and I'm honored to be here with my cellmates, uh, uh, cellmate Jerry Leftcourt, my friend Dennis Roberts. You know, there's, a, there's an irony here. Um, the judge who enforced the, war the uh, contempt citation and the arrest warrant against me that sent me to Chicago was then District Judge Harry Pragerson, who is now United States Court of Appeals Judge Harry Pragerson. My son, uh, two years ago, became United States District Judge for the Northern District of California and sat by designation with Harry Pragerson on the Ninth Circuit. And Judge Pragerson assured him that sending one tiger per generation to jail was enough. 
and that John didn't have to fear asking questions at oral argument or doing any of the other things. He could just do it. Um, and I'm also glad to be here where we tried the Nichols case. Um, you know, that was, that was an experience, and people have asked me, what about this tie? You know, we collected our mail, Jane and I, at the little substation post office on Lincoln. And three weeks into jury selection, the postmistress gave me this tie, uh, which I thought, gee, I guess they're reading the paper. And Hal Haddon is not here tonight. He's had surgery. But Hal and I had tried the previous bombing case that was tried in that courthouse. Um, so it is good to be back here. Um, my theme is this. A few months ago, I spoke to a group of lawyers in Los Angeles. And I talked to them about legal ethics. I mentioned Henry Drinker, author of ABA Ethical Rules, author of a book that was the basis for the 1955 Rules of Professional Responsibility, and a founder of the Drinker Biddle firm. In noting the solipsistic nature of many ethical rules, I pointed out that in a 1927 speech to the ABA, Henry Drinker said that one of his biggest problems in enforcing legal ethics was, quote, keeping the Russian Jew boys out of the profession. <laughs> when the floor was open for questions, a Drinker Biddle partner, and himself an authority on ethics, criticized me for attacking Henry Drinker. We must remember, the questioner said, that he was the product of his time. And I thought to myself, what a miserable excuse. One of the worst things that could be said of anybody in this room is that he or she is the product of his or her time. How many times have we stood, how often have we stood beside some poor soul at sentencing and heard the judge intone a sentence that is simply a product of its time? And how often have we got some mindless letter from the appellate court that's simply the product of its time. I mean, whatever happened to the song lyric, oh beautiful for patriot dreams that see beyond the years? Some years ago, I was in South Africa, yes, during the apartheid period, and I picked up a magazine issued by a lawyer's association. I read there an editorial that said that lawyers have no duty to resist apartheid. Our job, they said, is to take the law as it is. Now, fortunately, there were many lawyers in South Africa who didn't subscribe to that view. No, we're advocates. Our job, our very reason for being, is to mediate between what is given and what is desired. Our job is to bridge the gap between our client's present fear and misery to a time when the client may receive something that merits the name justice. We do not have the luxury of being products of our time. As Angela Davis has said, we do not accept the things we cannot change. We struggle to change the things that we cannot accept. And so tonight I ask, what is our time this time? And what time should it be? This is a time of unprecedented invasion into the private lives, words, communications, and thoughts of almost every person in the world. This is a time when this surveillance and the technology of it seems beyond the reach of meaningful reform. John Oliver, the Comedy Central guy, sent reporters into Times Square a few months ago, and almost nobody who was interviewed remembered Edward Snowden and his path-breaking revelations. And for the most part, nobody cared much about all of this snooping. Well, not until the reporter pointed out that if for some reason you had sent somebody a picture of your genitals, <laughs> the NSA could and would store that picture. That provoked outrage. What? They have a picture of my dick? Now, <laughs> um, that's outrage. Now, that may say more about the male psyche than we have time to discuss this evening. <laughs> and I know, I know, some of us in the room voted for people who promised to take us out of the Bush era. And had we listened, we would know. They did what they promised, the NSA. At last, we have a government agency that really listens to you. <laughs> you know, 
Candidate, Candidate Obama promised that whistleblowers should not be subject to reprisals. You remember that? And now you tell Ed Snowden and Julius Assange that, huh? Reminds me a little bit of Bill Clinton. Barack Obama once taught constitutional law, but I think he didn't inhale it. <laughs> and the Congress, the Congress of the United States, are they enforcing the Constitution? I don't think so. It is my proposal that all the members of the Congress should be replaced with undocumented aliens, because they'll do jobs that Americans won't. And so, it is left to us, the advocates, as it has always been, to move from this time to a time we can all describe. It's a difficult task. Look what's happened to Edward Snowden, who had the courage to reveal what NSA is doing. The word traitor was shouted from the ramparts of government, not only refusing to accept that Snowden had revealed wholesale constitutional violations, but reflecting an ignorance of the constitutional text that defines treason quite narrowly. The truth shall set you free? Maybe. But as the Nigerian poet Wole Soyinka reminds us, first the truth must be set free. And we may contrast the treatment of Edward Snowden with that given to General David Petraeus, who revealed government secrets simply to lubricate his adultery. Uh, not only that, when the, the snoopers sling the word traitor, they also point to something they call the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. I'll say more about this, but it's not a court. Courts hear both sides. They have a public jurisprudence. And this apparatus of snoopery reflects, it rests on fear. We're told to accept it because we're afraid. Afraid of what? Basically of ethnic violence in and from the Middle East. That's the problem the snoopers tell us that they can solve. Well, I say nonsense. How about starting closer to home? Why don't we address the problem of ethnic violence in the Middle West? And then, if we could get that under control and make the lives of people of color matter there, then we could kind of work outwards. You see, now next door to in Utah, you are more likely to be killed by a cop than by gang violence or child abuse. Being killed by a cop is the second most prevalent kind of homicide in Utah. What's the first? Well, let me say, if you're married and it's not going well, watch out. <laughs> I mean, guys, you know, you can tell a lot about a, how a woman's feeling by looking at her hands. If she's holding a gun, she's probably angry. <laughs> I remember. <clears throat> so to come to our theme, remember what Justice Jackson said in Brenninger versus United States, he having just come back from his service on the Nuremberg Tribunal? Uncontrolled search and seizure is one of the first and most effective weapons in the arsenal of every arbitrary government. But the right to be secure against searches and seizures is one of the most difficult to protect, since the officers <clears throat> are themselves the chief invaders. There is no enforcement outside of court. So you and I have the means to address these issues. More than that, we have the duty to do it. The NSA's bulk collection of personal communications predictably and inevitably leads to the use of that information as the basis for jailing and prosecuting our clients. Civil suits against snooping have met with some success, but they face the government's assertion of state secrets and political questions. We, risk, we run the risk of getting involved in discovery disputes. Now, the frontier of the battle is where it's always been. Government levels a charge against our client, and we have the power and the duty to inquire how they got the evidence. This is not, as we know, saying that our client must be guilty and we're going to quibble about evidence gathering. The full inquiry into the government's methods often discovers that, it, that exculpatory evidence has been hidden and that the word intelligence is simply a name that's been given to hasty conclusions and unregulated suspicion. The term intelligence, indeed, is simply another example of how language has been hijacked in the service of unaccountable power. 
I cannot predict how their struggle will come out, but I'm heartened by knowing that with our lifetimes in the law, we have won victories by returning to the constitutional text. Think of Crawford versus Washington and Apprendi versus New Jersey. And so I want to talk about two tools that we have, ways of seeing the law, if you will. Call them weapons if you like, and imagine yourself as David's wearing only a jock strap with just a slingshot and a rock. Well, two rocks, actually, as we should see. Our first weapon is the Fourth Amendment definition of a search. A search of persons, houses, papers, and effects, which must not be unreasonable, and is presumptively governed by a warrant based on probable cause. For nearly 50 years, since Cats Against the United States, the Supreme Court has recognized that the new instruments of search and seizure do not destroy the old-fashioned Fourth Amendment protection. That protection was conceived in the shadow of broad-gauge searches of political dissidents, as we know from the old cases of Entick versus Carrington and Wilkes versus Wood. And in a nod to my mentor, Edward Bennett Williams, Cats was adumbrated in Silverman versus United States, which held that for Fourth Amendment purposes, penetration, however slight, was, well, you know. <laughs> it was the British searches under writs of assistance that led John Adams and others to their, off, to their acts of resistance. James Otis declaimed against arbitrary search, speaking on the Boston Common in 1761, and of that speech, John Adams later wrote, then and there was the child independence born. So the cat's holding that the Fourth Amendment protects people, not places, has heralded a series of other decisions. Camara held that the Fourth Amendment applies to administrative searches. Kwan held that the Fourth Amendment protection is not limited to searches designed to get evidence for criminal cases. So much for the we are just gathering intelligence argument, which is not only a lie but constitutionally illiterate. The Jardines case applied the Fourth Amendment, by the way, the copy of this will be available tomorrow. Don't take notes. You can, you know, the citations and so on. Jardines applied the Fourth Amendment to drug sniffer dogs around your front porch. Yet in April of this year, Rodriguez versus United States added some more sniffer dog protection. Riley versus California protects the contents of your cell phone. Jones put Fourth Amendment limits on GPS trackers. And just this term, the Supreme Court per curiam reviewed and renewed all this law in Grady versus North Carolina. Tracking is a search no matter where you are tracked. And also this term, the Supreme Court held that warrantless routine searches of hotel registrations are facially invalid under the Fourth Amendment. This case, this is City of Los Angeles versus Patel, is already being used by Google and others to protect internet consumer customer privacy. Now, the Second Circuit has recently given us ACLU versus Clapper. It's an opinion by Judge Jerry Lynch. It's rich in Fourth Amendment lore, even as Judge Lynch disclaims a desire to make constitutional law. The court holds that Section 215 of the Patriot Act cannot validly be the basis for what NSA is doing. If Congress intended that the NSA have such powers, that raise powers that raise such serious First Fourth Amendment issues, it must say so without equivocation. This is a judicial technique of avoiding constitutional questions that traces back to cases such as Kent B. Dulles and Good Connect against the United States. It was the first case I ever argued in the Supreme Court. Judge Lynch's opinion does say two things that are very important to the work that we must do. First, he rejects the government's assertion that intelligence gathering is somehow exempt from the Fourth Amendment because the objective, theoretically, is not to provide information for criminal cases. We've heard this argument before. I first argued against it in 1969. It's been rejected over and over. But the government still trots it out, even though it is at bottom a lie because the gathered information will always be leaked to cops and prosecutors. My mentor, Edward Bennett Williams, said, you know, there's no secret in Washington. There's just a 10-minute head start. <laughs> so Judge Lynch says, no, the Fourth Amendment violation occurs at the moment, the moment of the prohibited violation. Second, Judge Lynch rejects the argument that bulk collection does not intrude on the content of conversations, but only on the addresses or phone numbers and the names of what is sent and received. 
No, the court says, this sort of collection, quote, does proxy, close quote, for content collection. If the government has information that two people who are in regular communication or about a particular email address with certain characteristics, it can and does infer what those people are talking about. And I, I remember this because that was exactly the argument the government made in a case that I had in the Ninth Circuit 45 years ago, in which a pattern of telephone calls was used by the government at trial to infer what the callers must have been talking about. But the Second Circuit opinion in this line of Supreme Court cases say something that's broader and deeper than what might be suggested by this list. The message here is that this Constitution of ours was designed by people who were not so arrogant as to think that they'd anticipated every detail of every issue that might arise. They were not forging a set of fetters. They knew their words would have to be interpreted to make things, sense of things in changing times. I know the Congress, as Jerry said, has reworked the law of surveillance. For that, I think, is a, is a so what? A little bit. The fruits of the earlier illegality are still in government hands. And is there anybody in the room who trusts the government to obey the law, whatever the law might be? Is there anybody who believes that if a tool of intrusion is in the government's hands, it won't be used? The Foreign Intelligence Court has already spoken. We are not bound by what the Second Circuit says they have proclaimed. The new law from Congress doesn't bar bulk collection. Things will go on as before. Now, wait a minute. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, as I said, is not a court. A court, that, that hears arguments on both sides. And then it, it listens to both sides, and then it's generally open to the public. You know, a buffalo does not become a giraffe by sticking his neck out. <laughs> you know, it, it thinks it's a court, right? But what's in a name? A guy walks into a bar with a duck under his arm. Goes up, sidles up to a good-looking young woman at the bar and says, hey, honey, come here often. And she turns and says, what the hell do you mean bringing that pig in here? He says, no, this is a duck. And she says, I was talking to the duck. <laughs> What's in a name? So this court is a creature of the war against terror, T-W-A-T. Now, I understand, but I thought, I've, 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 somebody told me that, and it's offensive. I think that's offensive, and it's biased. So, I've, we should, it is the secret collection and retention of operational terrorism utility material, S-C-R-O-T-U-M. Now, oh. Now, I know that the line of Fourth Amendment authority is, is, is not unbroken, but we've been given the basic materials with which to strengthen the protection the amendment was designed to provide. You know, like Sisyphus, we keep rolling that rock up the hill. So our first weapon is the text and history and meaning of the Fourth Amendment, not as seen in former times, not as the government sees it in this time, but in a timeless and forward-looking way. The Fourth Amendment is not dead, though the devil's choir of the NSA is trying to sing its requiem. But here's another thought. Many of these cases are about dope dealers, gamblers, and defrauders. But the enduring value of the Fourth Amendment was established in those early precedents about opponents of colonial rule and organizers against tyranny. The right to be free of intrusion is the right of all people in a world filled with injustice to communicate with one another to understand their circumstances, and to act together in their common interest. That was Justice Jackson's message in Brenegar, brought to us fresh from his experiences at Nuremberg. So these are our truths. How do we set them free? In the defense of criminal cases, the government's claims to secrecy and non judiciability are at their weakest. Government assertions of the need for secrecy still exercise a powerful influence on judges, as many in this room have learned, at their clients expense. Our 1970s efforts to force revelation of exculpatory evidence shielded by state secrets claims were met with the Confidential Information Pretrial Procedures Act, SIPA. But you know, Brady and Giglio still exist. They're a powerful counterweight to SIPA. We're speaking, after all, not of one or two, but three constitutional-based rights 
to obtain information, the due process right to disclosure of exculpatory evidence, the right to confrontation is useless unless we have the information with which to do the confronting, think Jenks, the case, not just the Jenks Act, and the right to compulsory process means that we can seek and obtain the information that our clients need. Think Chambers against Mississippi in that wonderful article by Peter Weston in the Michigan Law Review. But when we can show that the government has or even may well have relied on illegally obtained evidence, these restrictions on disclosure retreat. The story begins with Learned Hand's opinion in the United States against Copeland. I know you know it, but I want to read some words. To purge the taint of illegal wiretaps, the court held, all the taps must be disclosed. Listen again. Few weapons in the arsenal of freedom are more useful than the power to compel a government to disclose the evidence on which it seeks to forfeit the liberty of its citizens. All governments believe that those they seek to punish are guilty. The impediment of constitutional barriers are galling to all governments when they prevent the consummation of that just purpose. But those barriers were devi devised and are precious because they prevent that purpose and its pursuit from passing unchallenged by the accused and unpurged by the alembic of public scrutiny and public criticism. A society which has come to wince at such exposure of the methods by which it seeks to impose its will upon its members has already lost the feel of freedom and is on the path towards absolutism. 1950. Huh? 185 F second, 629. The Supreme Court cited Copeland with approval in Dennis against the United States. Now this is a dinner talk and not a law review article. If you want a history of the way the judicial power has been exercised in the face of national security claims, look at the notes that will be in this text tomorrow in my book, Thinking About Terrorism. But the history of judicial independence of which Leonard Hand spoke dates to the time of John Marshall. Now some years after Copeland, along came Alderman with its companion case, some people don't remember this, of Ivanov versus United States. Ivanov was a Soviet citizen. The government had claimed that when it committed an illegality, the department that calls itself justice would review the matter and determine if the illegality was, quote, arguably relevant to the defendant's prosecution. Then and only then would they disclose the information. Well, whoever said that justice should be blind did not mean that the Department of Justice should be blind. <laughs> And the Supreme Court rejected the government's view, even in the face of dire warnings about mafia killers and Soviet spies. In oral argument, Justice Harlan raised the national security issue. Edward Bennett Williams replied, if we are driven to the unhappy conclusion that the alleged spy goes free, then I think we can draw some conclusion that in the last three decades of recorded federal jurisprudence, during which there were three wars, we have only one instance of an averred spy going free in this frame of reference, and she was the defendant in the case to which I allude, the Copeland case. And I think, he added, that we can also get a measure of consolation from the fact that of all the crimes in jurisprudence, espionage has the lowest rate of recidivism of any federal <laughs> felony. Yes. Here then are some but not all the ways in which we gain access to a place where something worthy of the name justice can be done. Here again is something that Ed Williams told the court in that case. It is not our argument in this court today that the executive branch should be manacled or impeded or harassed in the conduct of relationships with other governments. It is our argument here today that at least the federal courts should be a sanctuary in the jungle and that the fruits of this kind of conduct should not become evidence in a criminal case brought by the sovereign power against an accused. Now, I'm not suggesting the Supreme Court or any other courts will honor for sure these constitutional commitments. After all, the court hasn't always done right. Think of such horrors as the Dred Scott case, which Justice Greer said would put in a peaceful end to the slavery debate. Think of how many times judges have abandoned their duty in the face of rumored war and factitious claims of national security. We see the past, but the past is not there to bind us. It is the way over which we have come, and seeing it tells us where we must go. We are arguing before the judges with the support of our colleagues because we have this duty to do so. 
Our clients are not willingly in those courtrooms. We'll win some battles, and in all of the battles, we'll be painting a public picture of threatened injustice. These tasks that are being discussed tonight are not easy. I'm reminded of what William James said in 1887, dedicating a monument to Robert Gould Shaw. Shaw served in the Civil War bravely, but James celebrated him because Shaw chose to command a regiment of African-American soldiers. Military valor in that time, as in this one, was widely celebrated. And as William James said, that lonely kind of courage is the kind of valor to which the monuments of nations should be <clears throat> most of all be reared. For the survival of the fittest has not bred into the bone of human beings it is as, as it has bred military valor. And of 500 of us who could storm a battery side by side with others, perhaps not one would be found ready to risk his worldly fortunes all alone in resisting an enthroned abuse. Of course, I look around the room and I know that we're not alone. We stand in a line of advocates and their clients, from Andrew Hamilton in the Zenger case, to James Otis in 1761, to David Paul Brown representing workers, to Lord Brougham, to Darrow, to Clara Foltz, and beyond. They stood up for justice. How can we stand down? The movement doesn't need everybody, but it always needs somebody. The struggle is a relay race, and the baton's been passed for us. We have to carry it and look out for who will take it when our part of the race is run. So if you share that hope and that fragile faith, take out a piece of paper and a pen and write your name and the amount that you're going to give to the Foundation for Criminal Justice, and hand that paper to someone at your table who collect your responses. Because even Hamlet, confused as he was, recognize that these battles cannot be fought alone. He said this, the time is out of joint, O cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Nay, come, let's go together. Thank you.